Good morning. Um, I wanted to sort of introduce this talk, and I really can't take credit for <clears throat> a lot of the paper production. Uh, April Latham and um, uh, Eileen Fabian are co-chairs of a subcommittee on the USDA's Agricultural Air Quality Task Force, and this this particular effort was an outgrowth of some discussions uh, at the task force and um, in view of everything that's happening around ammonia and nitrogen in general, uh, the pressure on EPA to regulate a lot of those sources, we felt like as a committee that it was important that regulators understand the potential pitfalls and the limitations of regulating ammonia emissions under the Clean Air Act in, in particular. Uh, so that um, led us to develop a paper uh, to present those limitations and pitfalls. Uh, you see there the list of authors uh, that participated in this. I think it was about equal across the board there. And then, of course, the subcommittee that I mentioned that uh, April co-chairs also reviewed the paper and uh, provided input to the final form of it. The website that you see there is where you can access the full paper uh, on the USDA's Ag Air Quality Task Force website. Currently, ammonia is regulated through NPDES permits under the Clean Water Act, and I'm speaking at the federal level um, in my talk today rather than at state and local level. There's also some reporting requirements for ammonia under the uh, CERCLA and EPRA acts, and the reporting requirements for CERCLA, however, are on hold based on some congressional uh, actions. And then EPRA is still in effect for the, for the larger sources. One of the problems, of course, is how do you measure uh, the emissions? But EPA has recently proposed a PM fine or PM 2.5 implementation rule uh, to address ammonia as a precursor to PM fine uh, formation, and formation, and I will talk a little bit more about that uh, later in my discussion. Also pushing regulation, there, there were two petitions that were sent in to EPA, one in 2009, one in 2011. The the one in 2009 was a request to EPA to develop a new source performance standard for ammonia emissions from CAFOs. Uh, e the 2011 petition uh, was to establish ammonia as a criteria pollutant, list it, and then, of course, uh, set a standard, an ambient standard for it, which would trigger requirements on uh, sources. EPA has not responded to either petition and was recently sued by uh, both groups of petitioners and for its failure to respond. Now EPA can uh, respond by denying or accepting the petition. I suspect that they will probably deny in part or in whole both petitions, but they will most likely have to justify why they are not responding and then uh, proceed from there. So uh, the petitioners wanted a response within 60 days, um, and I doubt if that is going to happen as well. It's already well into the 60-day time period. But as you can tell, the pressure is on for the agency to do something about ammonia. There's also the Science Advisory Board's uh, Integrated Nitrogen Panel, which completed its work a year and a half or so ago, and it recommended a host of um, things for EPA and other agencies to do, but the primary one was that they felt like excess reactive nitrogen needed to be regulated, and they laid out some uh, suggestions for that. However, under the Clean Air Act, as it's written, it will be extremely difficult to regulate excess reactive nitrogen or ammonia as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. To date, EPA has never had to recognize the beneficial uses of a regulated pollutant under the Clean Air Act in the process of regulating it. If it's a designated pollutant under the Clean Air Act, it's bad. Get rid of as much of it as you can. Uh, neither has EPA regulated crop production, uh, but regulating ammonia emissions uh, could, of course, lead to that as well. 
Ammonia is different, you know that, we've been talking about that this morning already, but it's not just a pollutant, it's a nutrient that's integral to life. And um, as I said earlier, the Clean Air Act is very limited in what you can do once a pollutant is designated as a pollutant. Ammonia also has a chemical and biological component, and EPA has not regulated a biological pollutant uh, under the Clean Air Act uh, to date as well. So the paper that we developed lays out uh, some things that we would like the regulators to think about uh, before they regulate and not once they get into the throes of regulation. One of those is what is ammonia's role in agriculture. And of course, it's an essential nutrient for all life on Earth. Uh, the ability to chemically fix nitrogen from the atmosphere to form ammonia has helped shape modern agriculture's ability to sustain a growing global population. Uh, ammonia can be lost from the production cycle through volatilization, and these volatilization rates are highly variable. They're dependent on soil pH and moisture, they're dependent on the cropping systems, geographic location, management practices, climate, field variability, a host of things, these being, of course, some of the primary ones. And that, so how do you regulate something like that when there's so many variables um, and, and unknowns about those variables? When you get to the fate and transport and transformation of, of ammonia, it, the group felt that there is a fundamental understanding of the fate, transport, and transformation of ammonia. We understand a good bit about how it works uh, in the atmosphere, what happens. However, there's large uncertainty associated with the models uh, that track all of that or try to simulate that. Uh, the chemical reactions in the atmosphere are highly dependent on pneumonia, NOx and SOx concentrations, humidity and temperature, and once again, how do you factor that in to um, regulating, say, a, a pollutant? The impact of the agricultural environments, however, on the formation of secondary uh, ammonium particles is not well understood, and so bef since ammonia emissions represent from agriculture represent about 85 percent 80 to 85 percent of the total ammonia inventory in the u.s then agriculture is going to be impacted if you try to regulate ammonia uh, as a pollutant under the clean air act so there's a additional understanding of the effect of agricultural ammonia emissions also on the particle formation or of fine particle formation, we need to know more about that. So these last two bullets here are, are particularly important uh, for the modeling that would be needed to regulate uh, ammonia emissions and for just the general understanding of how it's work and working and how the uh, fine particles are formed. There's also some concern about the mitigation of emissions. Once you decide to regulate, of course, then you want to reduce the emissions of that pollutant. Uh, so how do you do that? Um, and the group felt like you cannot just look at manure storage and application. You've got to consider the entire production spectrum. And you've been working on a process-based model for a number of years, and we've seen improvements from uh, year to year at this symposium, but there's still, as recognized earlier, a long way to go. So the re and the reduction strategies are often uh, and most likely animal species specific. Um, how do you fact once again fact factor that in uh, to a regulatory process? The reduction strategies can be, of course, you can try to prevent the emissions from occurring. They can be pre-generation or uh, once the emissions are there, can, is there something you can do to mitigate the impact? Some of the pre-generation uh, sources are, diet, are dietary modification, housing design, covered manure storage, subsurface injection, and then some of the post-generation measures that could be utilized, of course, are siting of the facilities, vegetated buffers, exhaust air treatment. But some of these may be very cost prohibitive. 
and will that be recognized once you get into a regulatory atmosphere? Some other things before the agencies decide to regulate or go down that pathway. Um, we've struggled for some time now to monitor uh, these emissions. We've come a long way in developing methodologies to do that, measurement tools, models are improving for agricultural sources, but they're still not probably where you would like them to be uh, on an individual farm basis. Uh, so it's difficult to accurately measure these ammonia emissions from the sources. They're fugitive, they vary temporally and spatially, they're influenced by source, climate, management practices, and of course, how do you define a farm? Where are the emissions coming from? What are the sources that are considered for those emissions? Do you just measure at the fence line? Is that sufficient? Um, and let me just add that the definition of farm, EPA has not uh, decided on that yet. It's still a very open question. And if you take the point source or the uh, emission, the stack emissions that they are familiar with, dealing with, and apply that and those definitions to a farm, you get some very bizarre uh, and concerning results uh, in terms of uh, part of the definition now deals with ownership uh, and uh, some, other, what it, some other factors as well. We also had the National uh, Air Monitoring Emission Study. Uh, to look at um, the em emissions from the different CAFOs, uh, and that effort has, of course, met with limited success in terms of just the monitoring itself, and then the development of the mission factors um, from that study and those studies uh, is sort of in limbo right now, I think is probably the, the kindest thing to say about that. So. Given the fact that we can't measure these emissions very well and with great accuracy at the moment, and certainly not with the accuracy that you would hope to have in to have direct regulation of those emissions, and the fact that EPA is struggling on the emission factor development, um, led us to want to caution um, EPA before to complete some of this science and effort before they regulate. Also, if you've got a problem, you've got the pollutant, then, like I said, if you set a standard, then what is, what is the way to reduce that pollutant and what are the best management practices to reduce this excess ammonia? Uh, those practices need to be validated. They need to be validated at the field level, and a lot of that has not happened uh, to date. Also, we feel like that EPA should embrace a holistic approach to agricultural sources, uh, avoid the one-size-fits-all, what works on the dairy in Texas may not work in the on the dairy in Idaho and in other areas, and so how do we prevent that and lead them to a different approach or model for that? And then also, uh, this holistic approach would hopefully lead to the agency not looking at just the water problems created and the air problems as separate in entities, but looking at the whole farm system and the production system as a whole. The question I think that's on the table is, is will there be time to make a lot of these changes to answer some of these uh, questions before the agency is either decides to regulate or is forced uh, to regulate ammonia? Uh, EPA's response to the petitions, I think, will be very telling in that, and hopefully in the next few months we would know sort of where the agency is headed on that. The PM fine implementation rule, of course, has, is requiring them to look at ammonia emissions as a precursor to PM fine formation, but with the exception of California, uh, those non-attainment areas are very limited probably where you have a dairy operations or other large type of animal operations. However, we're aware probably in this room of the recent litigation, the RICRA decision um, regarding the excess nutrients applied, those considered as a waste or considered as imminent and substantial endangerment under RICRA. Uh, 
of all the programs at EPA, and I spent a good bit of time there, uh, I think the most <laughs> draconian law in place is the RICRA law, uh, as opposed to the, the Water or, or Air Act. Not to say any of them are great, they provide great results a lot of times, but some of them are very difficult uh, to deal with. And also there was a recent court case, the Sierra Club versus EPA, that was decided in the Sixth Circuit uh, just this month where uh, the judge said that the agency wrongfully redesignated an air, a PM fine area to attainment <laughs> Uh, and the, the states involved, two of the states involved, uh, had not placed mandatory RAC and RACM requirements on the sources in that area, even though those were not necessary to reach attainment, and the court said that was wrong, and, and they said you've got to withdraw the approval um, for the attainment status of the area. Not sure how that would spill over or if it would spill over to ammonia, since ammonia would be a precursor, but it's certainly disturbing uh, that the statute is so restrictive and strict that even unnecessary regulations or control measures might be required uh, if they're not needed. The PM fine implementation rule uh, to deal with ammonia as a precursor was signed on March 10th. There's a 60-day comment period ending on March 22nd, on May 22nd, and it does deal with ammonia as a precursor uh, to fine, par fine particle formation. The agency had originally said that ammonia regulation ammonia was out unless an area demonstrated that was actually controls were needed for those sources to bring the area into attainment and this decision the court decision sort of flipped that on them so now states have to consider uh, control measures for all PM 2.5 sources and their precursors uh, from all sources that includes smaller sources like area sources that are called area sources under the Clean Air Act all non-attainment areas are originally classified as moderate, and but they have to attain as expeditiously as practicable within six years. And if, remember that phrase for a moment, as expeditiously as practicable. Uh, then if they can attain or show they're not going to be able to attain, then they can be bumped up to serious, which has, of course, more requirements. The Clean Air Act does have a provision to provide for a specific exemption for major, sta major stationary sources or precursors if they do not contribute significantly to non-attainment. Uh, but also as a part of that, demonstrating attainment requires as expeditiously as practicable. So if those sources could be Reduction in those sources should could be shown to get to the area could get to attainment at least a year earlier than they might have to be controlled even with this language uh, in place. Uh, major sources would be exempt from RACT and RACM is is how uh, and BACM and uh, and from new source review is the way that EPA is proposing to interpret it. and of course they're taking comment uh, on all of this. They do provide some options that a state could use to show that you don't need to control ammonia emissions, um, and they will uh, determine whether to include just one of those options. They may include all three, and they might include some others, but uh, it's still open for comment on uh, how many options or ways a state might make this demonstration. The good news is if ammonia is out, if the state demonstrates that and doesn't need regulating, if it's out for the non-attainment area SIP, then it's also out for new source review, which of course is another permitting process. The PSD requirements for permitting uh, in attainment areas within a state did not change, so therefore there are no PSD requirements for ammonia um, as a precursor for PM fine uh, at the moment. So that is, that is very good, good news. The major source definition uh, for PM fine was kept the same as the definition for PM10, but the agency is taking comment uh, on that. Uh, serious areas, there's some requirements in the rule about serious areas and uh, whether or not they would have to control all sources 
of precursors or whether the exemptions for precursors might be applied um, in those areas as well. And California, of course, might be very interested in how this turns out. The agency is also considering uh, looking at a de minimis source category, say if there was a, a category of sources that contributed two to three percent of the inventory, uh, could the state, and those were not, those controls on those sources were not needed to meet attainment or to show attainment, then EPA is considering uh, exempting the whole source category. And I don't know how the recent uh, lawsuit decision would uh, impact that particular proposal that they've made. And then if, if an area fails to attain within 10 years, then 5% reductions per year of direct PM fine emissions and of the precursors are required until attainment is reached. So anyway, that's sort of a uh, thumbnail sketch of the PM fine implementation rule. And then I guess in summary, uh, ammonia is a critical component of a natural biological cycle. Farmers of the U.S. and the world must meet the food, fiber, and fuel needs of the projected 9 billion people by 2050. And increasing yield and maintaining and improving soil health are essential to meet this standard and to meet this demand. And there is a lot of concern that inappropriate regulation of ammonia uh, could impact the ability of farmers to produce and to feed the world. And it is uncertain at this time then how EPA could, under the Clean Air Act, factor in soil health, food production uh, into its regulatory approach. Uh, the group uh, in the task force agreed that any regulation of ammonia under the Clean Air Act must address its impact on the sustainability of domestic and global food supply as part of the mandatory statutory requirement to evaluate public and welfare effects and the vitality of rural communities. And I'm not aware of uh, any regulation in the past where EPA has had to address or has felt the need to consider the food supply as part of the health and welfare effects um, of any of its rules. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Mm -hmm. um, I have two questions. The first, we have seen, at least with the water office at EPA, where the environmental groups will file these lawsuits and then EPA will settle with them to get, basically, to get what they want. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening with either of these petitions? Um, I think the, the one for setting our listing ammonia as an ambient air polluting and it becoming a national ambient air set quality standard or a NAC standard, I don't see the agency moving in that direction. I don't think the science is there for them to be able to do that. I think the in reading through the petition, I think there are, uh, there's a lot of extraneous information thrown in by the Enviro groups that, that filed that one. And um, I don't think the agency wants to take on ammonia as, as a pollutant right now. In fact, they didn't really want to deal with it as a precursor uh, for PM fines, uh, and, and the court uh, turned over their approach for that. So um, the one on the NSPS, the New Source Performance Standard, um, is a little more iffy, but I don't see the agency agreeing to move forward on that before they finish up their work on names. Uh, because they've basically said we can't estimate the emissions from these sources, so that would be one of the first steps for, being, for setting an NSPS. They would have to uh, be able to predict the uh, emissions from the sources, and then they would have to know what the controls were that were required and how much reduction they would get from those controls. And those were some of the questions that we felt like are, are unanswered at this point. 